This morning's platform is the 2020 U.S. Census with Jeff Baylor. Mr. Baylor began his Census Bureau career in the Detroit Regional Office in 1997, working as a survey statistician on various programs. In 2002, he transferred to the Census Bureau headquarters in Zootland, Maryland, to work on the Dicennial Management Division as a project manager on the 2004, 2005, and 2006 census tests. In 2005, he returned to the field division and served as Chief of Housing and Health Surveys Branch. Mr. Beller transferred to the Dallas Regional Office in December of 2006, where he served as the Assistant Regional Director. In 2007, he was selected as the Deputy Regional Director and was responsible for a wide range of activities related to the 2010 census for the Dallas region. In October 2010, Mr. Bella was selected as the regional director for the Detroit region and led the restructuring efforts as Detroit was one of the six regional offices to close in 2012. In January 2013, Mr. Bella became the director of the New York regional office. Mr. Beller has a bachelor's of science, a uh, bachelor's degree, excuse me, in statistics, mathematics, and actuarial science from Central Michigan University, as well as a master's in leadership and management from the University of Maryland University College and a master's certificate in project management from George Washington University. He resides in Robbinsville, New Jersey, with his wife and two daughters. Please welcome Mr. Beller. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I uh, just want to thank the New York Society for Ethical Culture for this opportunity. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. And I hope to, to uh, educate you on what the 2020 census is, and, and maybe more importantly, in the environment we're currently in, what it's not. Uh, before I get started, I do want to introduce Zakira Ahmed in the back. She's the partnership coordinator responsible for all uh, partnership activities throughout New York City. So she has quite a job and just amazing person. <laughs> all right, so again, my name is Jeff Baylor, Regional Director for New York. It's one of six regions we have across the country. We're responsible for all data collection activities. The New York region, we're responsible, of course, all of New York, all of New Jersey, all of the New England states, and Puerto Rico. So we have quite a large territory to cover for the 2020 census. And our goal, everything we do related to the 2020 census is to count everyone once, only once, and to count them in the right place. And I'll get into the details on that. I do want to mention that we have a staff of over 1,000 field representatives knocking on doors every day. You hear about the unemployment rate that comes, the, comes out the first Friday of every month. We collect that data, the Census Bureau collects that data for the Bureau of Labor Statistics, who releases the unemployment rate. You hear about housing starts, crime indices, uh, data from the Center for Disease Control. Our staff is out there knocking on doors every day collecting very important information. I raise this only because I don't want anyone to think it's a scam if the Census Bureau is knocking on your door in the year 2019. A lot of people realize, they understand, they, they hear about the Census in the years ending in zero. But we are out there every day knocking on doors. So, as mandated, Article 1, Section 2, why do we do the census? Well, it's in the Constitution, and it mandates that we count everyone living in the United States. We don't care about status, whether they're here legally or illegally. Our job, per the Constitution, is to count everyone. One of the biggest things I can say, it's this, this a lower uh, bullet here regarding privacy and confidentiality. We, we kind of had a, a catchphrase in, in 2010 that, we'll, that I like to use uh, for 2020 as well. We always talked about it's safe, it's easy, and it's an important. And I want to hit those three things in my discussion today. So it's safe. Title 13, federal law, prohibits anyone at the Census Bureau from disclosing information that could identify a person or a household. What does that mean? That means every piece of data we collect, we cannot release to any law enforcement agency, to any federal government agency, local government agency, state government agency, any private organization. The data we release 
is statistical summaries of a geography, whether that's a census tract, whether that's a congressional district, a county, a state, all right? By law, we cannot uh, release information on an individual or on a household. And that's important. That tr Public trust is the foundation of everything we do. And Title 13 has stood the test of time. It came into, I think, 19, in the 1950s. And we've been taken to federal court by a lot of federal, other federal agencies, private organizations, wanting to access our data at the household level. And we've won every time. It would take an act of Congress to change this law. So whatever administration's in place, whatever, whoever says they want our data, um, we cannot release it unless it's in a statistical summary, as we typically do, okay? So it's safe. I also want to mention that um, regarding it's safe in Title 13, every one of us who ever works with census data, whether that's collecting it, uh, researchers who use data for uh, purposes within the Bureau, are sworn to Title 13. I can be in prison for up to five years. I can be fined up to $250,000 if I release any information that identifies an individual or a household. And we are sworn for life. Not just while we're working at the Bureau, but sworn for life. So it is, it is very important to us. Okay, so that's safe. Let me talk a little bit about why it's so important. Over $675 billion of federal funding is disseminated every year based upon census data or formulas using census data for the largest 16 programs. When you add in community block grants and other things, we believe it's over $800 billion is disseminated every year. So what does that mean? That's money for Medicaid, that's money for your infrastructure, for schools, for healthcare. Is all, all these funds are based upon formulas using census data. So that means if people don't get counted in 2020, it doesn't just affect them and their community that year, it affects their community for the next 10 years. So that's one of the biggest selling points we have on why the census is so important, all right? We also talk about power, congressional redistricting. Uh, there's a concern that uh, if there's an undercount in the state of New York, that they'll lose another two congressional seats this year, all right? So we wanna make sure, I can't control the number of congressional seats, but what we can control is ensuring everyone gets counted. And then, of course, states use our data for their voting rights uh, uh, or voting uh, districts. They use it for their um, redistricting efforts at the state level. So it's extremely important. And then private agencies use our data for planning. You know, we, we work with uh, large companies, provide data profiles that are available publicly. You know, if they want to open a new plant, if they, they want to see what the community are, do they have people who would be willing to work? You know, what are, what are the... Um, What's the, the demographics of the people in that particular community? So a lot of private agencies, private organizations use our data too. So it's extremely important. This infographic is just kind of a high level of how we do a census and I'll briefly run through it. Step one, establish word account. Just think of this as creating an address list of every address where someone lives or could live in the United States. Every apartment, every home. So how do we do this? We started with the 2010 address list, and then throughout the decade, we're getting updates from the Postal Service. When our employees are out there knocking on doors, we're updating address lists. We work with local governments uh, in, in mid-decade. We allow them the opportunity to give us addresses and provide feedback on our address lists. And then right before the census, we have a new construction program allowing local uh, governments to once again provide us with any new addresses that could be uh, someone could be living there as of April 1st, 2020. So again, the goal here is if we have every address, we can make sure we get an invitation out to every address to allow people to participate in the census. So once we know where people live or could live, we have to motivate them to respond, our second step. So we'll have a national media campaign. Uh, you'll see us on commercials and things like that in early 2020, but most importantly is our local partnership program, what Zakira is, is coordinating. It's working with community-based organizations, understanding from them what the challenges are for their community and working with them on the solutions. How do we motivate their community members? How do we gain their trust? Zakir and I will go and speak at any event. We love to go out there to uh, educate people on the census, but we know it's more important when it's coming from you. You are the trusted voices in your community. That's what the, partnership, the local partnership program is about. 
Step three, counting the population. Remember I talked about it's safe, it's easy, it's important. Let me talk about it's easy really quick. Four ways to be counted in 2020. This is very different from what we've done in the past. First off, you can fill it out online. For the first time ever, we'll allow you to go online. 80% of the country, the very first mailing that we do in Mar mid-March of 2020, isn't gonna be a census form. It's gonna be an invitation to go online. Here's a website, here's your census ID, which just is a 12-digit number. It takes the place of your address, all right? And we ask you to go online and fill it out. Okay, so that's the first way, online. The second way, we've always had a toll-free number to, for support. If people had questions or they needed a form resent, for the first time ever, we'll be actually collecting information over the phone. So that's another way you can fill out your census form. You can call the toll-free number and give your information to the operator over the phone. The third way is filling it out on a questionnaire, paper forms. We'll still have paper forms. So I talked about 80% won't get that paper form that in that first mail out that we send. We're gonna send a total of five mailings to every household, all right? When we get to our fourth mailing, if that particular address hasn't uh, filled out their census form or they haven't went online, they haven't uh, called the toll-free number, we will include a paper questionnaire. So everyone will still have the opportunity to fill it out on paper if that's the choice they prefer, prefer okay? And then the fourth way we count people, the most costly way, is in 2010 we hired over 500,000 people nationwide to go out there to knock on doors in their community, ask those same questions that are on the census form. All right, so we would much prefer, it's much cheaper for the U.S. taxpayer mm -hmm. if people fill it out themselves, higher quality um, rather than sending someone there. We're anticipating needing to hire between 350 to 400,000 people nationwide for 2020. All right, so those are the four ways you can fill it out. Online, over the phone, on paper, or a representative coming to your door. How do you distinguish between some of these? So we're gonna take questions at the end. Yeah, we'll take questions at, so you get the first question, I promise. Um, so this chart here, what's cool about online is now we have the ability to have the questionnaire in different, different languages. So these 12 languages in the middle that are bolded, mm -hmm. will, uh, you'll be able to, just from a drop-down box, select that particular languages. Those 12 languages make up roughly 95% of the, the uh, responses we typically receive. Okay, so it's not every language, we certainly understand. Also, in the very first letter that we send out that invites you to go online, there's gonna be a, another piece of paper in there with a toll-free number for each one of those 12 languages, and the message will be in that native language, inviting you, if you wanna call in your information over the phone, call this particular number. So there's gonna be 13 numbers there. You call that number, let's say you call the number, uh, the uh, Korean number, someone who speaks Korean is gonna pick up that phone and answer the phone speaking Korean, all right? So you don't have to ask for a particular language, the, the number will direct that. So we're really excited about that. All the other languages around there, we're gonna have videos online posted to tell people how to fill out their form in English uh, in those particular languages. Total of 59 languages in total. Um, we know there's a lot more languages in New York City than 59. That's where our local partnership program comes in. So we need to hire people both as translators and employees who can work with us to help translate the message um, to set up workshops or, or fill out your forum sites that I'll talk about in a little bit. So we're excited about the languages. Kind of a high level um, look ahead to, to 2020. So we started our partnership program. I'm gonna talk shortly about complete count committees uh, and the importance of community leaders getting involved in the census. We opened up uh, two offices here in New York City uh, in, in uh, last month and uh, one this month, so a total of two. We're gonna be opening up a total of 13 offices in New York City, all right? What does that mean, jobs? And I'll talk about jobs here shortly. Uh, those other 11 offices in New York City, we're gonna open up this June and July. Uh, Region-wide or within New York State, we have a total of 21 census offices. These offices aren't public offices. They're offices that will support the people who are out there knocking on doors. So they hire the people, they train the people, they make sure they get paid on a weekly basis. That's their role. It's not for the public to come in to fill out a form or to apply for a job, okay? 
Advertising again will begin in, in early of 2020. That's when you'll start seeing uh, information, education about the census. Census day is April 1st, 2020. So all the questions we ask are about April 1st, 2020. We'll start knocking on doors May 13th of 2020. So online will, response will begin in mid-March. That's when the first, even though census day is April 1st, we're gonna start mailing out invitations mid-March. You'll be able to call or, or go online and fill out your form then. And you'll continue to be able to do that through July. But in May, if we haven't received a response for an address, that's when we go start knocking on doors, okay? And then by law, we have to get the counts, so the state counts, the national count of how many people we counted by December 31st of 2020. We turn that information, just the count, over to the president. And then by March 31st of 2021, we have to give the states all of their population data so they can begin their redistricting efforts, okay? Just a quick uh, view at a map that kind of shows the areas in which each of the offices uh, are gonna cover. Again, 13 offices in New York City, another eight throughout New York State. So when we open up these offices, we need managers to run these offices. So you think about it, we're gonna be opening majority of the offices up this June, July. They'll stay open through 2020, so it's about 18 month job, 40 hours a week. We need an office manager in every office. We need an admin manager, an IT manager, a recruiting manager, all right? So we need help in getting people who are interested in working for us um, in these offices, okay? So that's one opportunity, working in an office. In addition to all those managers, we're gonna need to hire supervisors, we're gonna need to hire clerical staff. Again, 40 hours a week um, and for roughly 18 months. The majority of positions that we hire on the census are gonna be our census takers, our enumerators, the people who are out there working in the community, okay? This can be a great second or third job for people. It doesn't have to be a 40 hour a week job. You can be successful working nights and weekends. And in New York City, we're paying $25 an hour, plus paid training and any mileage or uh, uh, subway reimbursement, mass transit reimbursement to get to your work assignment and back. All right, so it's a pretty good job for people. And when you think about the timing, Starting in May, going through July, students, teachers, college kids who want to make some extra money, this is a great opportunity. 2020census.gov backslash jobs. That website is live right now. If you don't want to listen to me and you want to go online right now and apply for a job, you can. All right, we need your help in sharing this information about jobs. We want to get people to recruit now. Apply for these jobs right now. Um, it doesn't mean you have to work right now. It doesn't mean that if we call you and, and now's not a good time for you, you want to work, you know, next May when we're out there knocking on doors, that's okay. You know, we'll offer you a position. If, if you can't accept it at this time, you go back in the pool and we'll call you again when the next operation runs. All right? So any help you can do to get the message out that the Census Bureau is recruiting. I always say the Census is a national event, but to be effective, to be successful, it has to be conducted at the local level meaning we have to hire people to work in their own neighborhoods. We don't need to be bringing people in, shifting them all over. They have to speak the language. They have to look like the people who live in those neighborhoods, okay? All right, so let me talk a little bit about the partnership effort and, and how you can help. So these are all challenges that we have, uh, not just the Census Bureau, but, but a lot of organizations have these challenges. You know, a distrust in government, you know, for, for, <laughs> I, enough said, distrust in government. <laughs> um, a more mobile population, a lot of renters, couch surfers, informal complex living arrangements. We know uh, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico brought a lot of different kind of living arrangements, Well, now multiple families are living in one unit. And let me say, I, I'm working closely with, with New York City, Deputy Mayor Thompson, the Census Director Julie Menon. We don't care if people are staying in a home illegally, you know we need to make sure they get counted because resources for the next 10 years depend on it. Okay, so we know there's that increasingly diverse popula uh, population, rapidly changing use of technology. These are all in our environment. So how do we tackle those challenges? Again, trusted voices. We're looking for the community members that are trusted voices. And I'll give you a couple examples uh, as, as we go out. And we always ask for, for two things from every partner. Help us employ people in the neighborhood. Help us get people to apply for jobs. And then the second one, when the time comes to be counted, help us get that message out. 
So what we ask is, what is that right message for your community? What's going to get them motivated to respond? Do they not trust us? Do they not understand it's their civic duty? You know, is the, the uh, message that about the federal funding, so looking at the programs that their community supports, that those community members receive, whether it's SNAP or WIC or uh, National School Lunch Program, all those that are dependent upon formulas using census data. So we need help in determining for that community what's the right message. And then how do we get that message to the community? Who is the trusted voice? Is there a, a newspaper we should be working with? Uh, you know, not, not one of these national newspapers, but you know, is there a targeted newspaper in a particular language? Is there a radio station that we could do a short PSA in language uh, you know, to help the community members understand what the census is in 2020? These are some of our partners. Uh, to give you an idea, colleges and universities, libraries. I talked about you know, applying for jobs online. You can fill out your census form online. We're looking for partners who have computer resources. We want to make it easy for everyone to fill out the form to do it online if, if they choose to do that. So libraries, they have computer banks. A lot of a community college have computer banks. We ran a census test in 2018. We were the only uh, uh, area in the country that had a census test in Providence County. And we found that libraries and community college were excellent partners. We want to host job fairs. You know, well, we provide the resources. Staff will come in from the census to teach people how to apply for a job, to help them with any uh, information they need in creating their account. And then when the census rolls around, when it's time to fill out your, your census form, could we go back to that same location and have a party and have a local leader talk about why it's so important? or that community organization or that church pastor talk about why the census is so important and then have people fill out their form right then and there. So these are opportunities that we're looking for partners that, uh, that to work with. Some of our initiatives, again, our initiative for your community it will be based on your community. That's what we need to know. If there's something specific we need to do, whether it's a language, whether it's, it's a culture, uh, we're here to work with you and to partner with your community how we'll support our partners. So we're gonna have a whole toolkit, a social media toolkit, um, messaging toolkit. But again, we know that our message, the message that is created by our contractors may not be the right message for your community. That's where we have to work together to change it, to make it fit, to make it motivate your community and move forward. So some of the things you can do, participate in a complete count committee. And I'm gonna go through that here shortly. Uh, event like this, allowing us opportunities to come in and speak to educate people on what the 2020 census is. Sharing the message via newsletters or email blasts, email groups, whether it's through the church. Uh, have a conversation with your, your colleagues at, at, uh, at your job. Have a conversation with members of your church, any other community organization, talking about what the census is, that it's safe, that it's easy, and how important it is to the community. And again, help us with recruiting opportunities. So a complete count committee, I can tell you the state of New York has a complete count committee. New York City has a complete count committee. Each of the boroughs are starting their complete count committees. Within the boroughs, community boards, churches, uh, certain uh, ethnic groups are starting their own complete count committees. What, this, what a complete count committee is, it's a group of individuals who understand the geography in which they cover, What's, whether that's a neighborhood, whether that's a building. You can have a complete count uh, committee for a building, for an apartment building. All right, and they work together on getting the message. What's the right message to share with everyone who lives in that building? And then are there events that we can do? All right, who is that trusted voice? Who will those people listen to? And I'll share with you two examples that are pretty cool. Uh, again, complete count committee, it needs to be as inclusive as possible. This isn't a Republican Democrat thing. This isn't a, a race thing. Everyone needs to be counted, everyone living here. And then we have subcommittees. Again, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but uh, you, you have your, your general committee, and then you could have subcommittees, maybe a, a group of people who focus just on jobs and how to get the word out to the community about jobs. Maybe another group that, that'll deal with faith-based organizations. You know, how do we, we pull together all the leaders of churches in that particular area, whether it's a city or, or a neighborhood? Again, some examples. Um, you know, uh, materials, using our materials, adapting our materials, uh, working to, together with us on the messaging. Uh, again, if the, the one thing to take away from this is a complete count committee works with us 
we work with you to understand what are the challenges and then let's work together on the right solutions because we know if, if you count on us, the Census Bureau, to, to effectively reach out to every community, we will not be successful. You know your community better than anyone else and we need your help. Great tool that we have available, you can go online at census.gov and you can just search for Roam, R-O-A-M, Response Outreach Area Mapper. And basically, we took data from the 2010 census, self-response rates, okay? So self-response rates, I think nationally, we were around 70%, 71%. That's the number of people who filled out their form and sent it back, all right? Self-response rate. That's not the total number of people who were counted. That's closer to 100% because what that self-response rate doesn't include is us going out there knocking on the doors, collecting the data, okay? So you may hear that a lot. The self-response rate was 71% or 64% in this community. We have some in New York City, some neighborhoods that were you know, in the 30s. That means only 30% of the people who got the form filled it out and mailed it back in. The other 70% we had to go knock on their door, okay? The darker areas, the darker shaded areas are areas we think are harder to count in 2020, all right? And how do we come up with that? We take the self-response rates from 2010 and then we add data from the American Community Survey. So the American, anyone ever get the American Community Survey? Super long, yeah. It's about, it'll take you close to an hour. It's very detailed. It was what the long form was back in Census 2000. So one out of every six households got this long form, which is really the characteristics of the nation. Income, educational attainment, health-related, home-related statistics. So we take data from that American Community Survey which we now conduct on a monthly basis, which means instead of waiting every 10 years for a refreshed set of characteristics of your neighborhood, we're giving them now every year because we're collecting data on a monthly basis. But we know children on the age of five are a typically undercounted group. Afri African American males ages 18 to 24. Foreign born, people who move a lot, renters, those are all challenges. So we took the information from the ACS for that particular census tract added in the, the self-response rates from 2010, and we came up with a, low, uh, a hard to count score. And again, the darker, the shade, that, and these are census tracts, so it's roughly about four to, anywhere from four to, to um, 12,000 individuals in a census tract. Um, the darker the shade, the harder we think it is gonna be to count. So this is what we're using to prioritize our resources. When we're hiring staff, we wanna hire them that speak the languages in those communities, that have this, the cultural background as those communities. But this is available out there, and we can do a workshop if anyone's interested. Zakira uh, can teach you how to use this, this uh, great tool and to read the data. The last thing I wanna mention uh, before the, the, the two examples is we have a data dissemination program. So a lot of people don't realize that all the data we collect, we then release in, in statistical summaries. Majority of federal grants now require the use of American Community Survey data. So we have a workshop and it's free. All of our data is free and it's out there to the public. Again, it doesn't identify individual, it doesn't identify a household, it's a statistical summary. So one of the most popular workshops we do is a grant writing workshop. We don't teach you how to write a grant, we teach you how to access that very specific piece of data you need to tell your story. As an example, we. We helped uh, a community organization. They wanted to know how many single moms between the ages of 24 and 35 with two or more kids with educational attainment less than the ninth grade with an income between 35 and $50,000. We sh will teach you how to find that data. And then you just save it and then every year you change 19 to 20, 20 to 21, and you get a refresh summary of that particular data. Small businesses, we do a workshop for small business owners. There's a great small business builder tool on our website, again for free, that you put in your information and when you're done, it'll spit out a business plan that you could take to a bank. Uh, it'll tell you about, you know, if you're looking, let's say I own a daycare and I'm looking to open a second daycare in this area, it'll tell me what does the clientele look like in my area. I don't want to go to an area where there's no kids, right, if I'm opening a daycare. So it's just great information. A lot of people don't realize our data is out there for free. There are a lot of private organizations who take our data, they package it up, and they sell it to people, all right? We wanna teach you how to access that for free. So I, I wanted to mention two stories, uh, two very different um, 
uh, on the spectrum of, of ways to partner in, in 2020. I was having a meeting with the mayor of Boston and we talked about you know, online self-response and it's gonna be formatted for tablets and smartphones. And I, I mentioned that census ID that you get in the mail, okay? You go online, you enter that 12 digit number and then you can go ahead and enter your census information. Well, let's say you lose that. You can still go online. It's just you're gonna have to key in your address and your nearest cross streets. And then behind the scenes, we're looking for that 12 digit number and we're gonna attach it. And again, the, the whole point of that is just that when we release the data at the end of the census, we're releasing it in the right place, okay? So that 12 digit ID is just a, a replacement for your, your, uh, your address. But we were talking, you know, on April 1st is right around opening day. And the mayor said, how cool would it be if at the Red Sox game, say between the third and the fourth inning, on the Jumbotron, Big Poppy comes on the screen and says, hey everyone, take out your smartphone right now. Do you know it's time to fill out your census? This is why the census is important to the state of Massachusetts, the city of Boston. And people can fill it out right then and there, right? They key in their address, they enter their information. More importantly, I think of those communities that don't trust the government. They don't understand the census, okay? And we find out who is their trusted voice. Let's say it's a, the, the, their pastor, all right? So we have an event at church, and the, you know, during the sermon, the, the pastor talks about how Mary and Joseph were going to Bethlehem to be counted and the importance <laughs> of the census and, and, and what it means for the community, you know, how much the community depends on a lot of these federal programs. And then it's not, okay, go home and wait for you to get your response. Let's have a party afterwards with music and games for the kids, and let's bring in some laptops and have, have the community fill out their census right then and there. That is a game changer this decade. The people who don't trust us, the, the people who don't understand, we're looking forward to that. I will say there will, I promise you, there will be scams when 2020 rolls around. Uh, that's when I talked about what the census is and more importantly what it's not. We will never ask for your social security number. We will never ask for money. We will never ask for bank account or credit card information. So if you hear anything like that, please reach out to us. We want to get it out in the media, let them know a scam's going on. I can tell you I was in Dallas in 2010. Organization put the word census on the top of the form and had like five or six questions. And then on the bottom, um, send your check for $10 into this address. And people did it because they saw the word census and they just assumed that was the official census. So. And that's another reason complete count committees and communities are so important. We can work together to make sure when, when someone does try to scam others, we can stop it in its place, okay? These are our contact information. If you wanna know anything about partnership, you can certainly get my card or Securus card, uh, census jobs, again, the websites and the data dissemination program. But we're here, uh, if you need anything, don't hesitate to can't, uh, contact us uh, anytime. So uh, we have a few minutes for questions. I think, sir, you had the first question. Yes. Uh, how do you prevent someone from uh, being counted twice? Mm. Great question. And, and also, for example, in my particular case, I just moved into a retirement home, but I still own the apartment in which I used to live. Mm -hmm. So why not automatically get counted twice? So you, you will have the ability to fill out two forms, absolutely, one at your home and one at your retirement community. We do an unduplication matching program at the end of the census. So let's say you know the census form comes in, I fill it out, and then my wife also fills it. She's in that event, she fills it out too. We have a matching program that we do at the end of the census, which looks for multiple forms for a household, and we'll select one of them. Same way we match people across households. We talked about undercount, um, but over, overcount's an issue too, people being overcounted, snowbirds, someone who has a home in Florida and, and a home you know, in the north. Um, college kids are typically overcounted group. The parent wants to count them at their home, but they also fill out a form when they're at college. So we have a, an unduplication process that we do at the end. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that you can speak to the citizenship question and uh, what the, Yeah, uh, so I can't really speak to it too much since I'm uh, being sued. I, you know, the Census Bureau is being sued. I can tell you kind of what led up to it. Um, by March 31st of 2018, we had to provide the list of questions to Congress. 
um, and we are prepared to do that. I think it was March 28th or 29th, the Secretary of Commerce introduced the, the citizenship question to the Census. So it was not the Census Bureau introducing this, it was, it was the, the Commerce Secretary. Um, in the most uh, recent, the New York case, uh, one of the, the, the um, witnesses that they called was our chief statistician. And he said that um, it will, this question will reduce response rate and it will increase costs. Um, that's about all I can really say about it right now. It is going to the Supreme Court. They have agreed to hear it uh, with hopefully providing a response by June of this year because June is when we start actually printing our forms. So we're hopeful that this will be wrapped up um, and we'll know whether we're moving forward with it or without it by June. I have a second question to follow on that. If the, that um, question gets onto the census, will any form that doesn't answer that question be invalidated? That's a great question. So similar to the past, um, if someone skips a question or two, we st they're still counted, all right? And we don't go knock on their door to try to get that particular information. What we do is it's a statistical kind of uh, estimate thing. It's called imputation. So at the end of the census, if we're missing part of a questionnaire, we may look at data from households around them and then assign a value to fill that in. We typically do that if we don't receive any response from a household. Um, we're just worried about quality because as soon as you start doing that, it reduces the quality. So what we're going to talk about, if the citizenship question does remain on the form for 2020, we're going to focus on Title 13. We're going to focus on that. Who, I don't care what administration says about the data. We cannot provide that to them by law. And it would take an act of Congress to change that particular law. Um, yeah. well, thank you for a very informative presentation. Um, are you concerned about cyber? You're not collecting social security and financial right. information, but it's still, you know. Personally, I don't, yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's protected by the Constitution, so how are you guarding against that in the current environment? Yeah, so I, I can tell you that once you submit your data, it's encrypted. And I can't tell you how we encrypt it because I will give a tip to those who want to hack. But basically, what encryption is, it scrambles your data, it puts noise in there so that if someone steals it, they can't read it. All right, so it's encrypted as soon as you enter it, both on the devices that we're collecting information, uh, if we're knocking on your door, as well as when you fill it out online. Um, cybersecurity has been our number one priority mid-decade, so a lot of the money we spent, we, we were criticized for not doing a lot of field tests throughout the decade. That's because the, the money we were given was used to focus on cybersecurity. So we have thousands of attempts every day to hack into our data and no one has been successful yet. But we're working with industry experts, both private and in the government. Um, we're, we're storing all the information uh, behind our firewall on our internal servers, uh, all the data that we collect. So we're working with our uh, communications contract. We need to be able to explain that in a non-scientific or statis uh, statistician type response to community, kind of layman's terms, so that all community-based organizations understand um, everything we're doing to, to thwart that. In the event there is a data breach, we have a system in place where we'll notify people immediately and we'll pay for the you know, security uh, for their data monitoring um, for a number of years. Yeah, that's a, another great question. So I can tell you the Census Bureau, the, the residence criteria that we use for the 2020 Census is we count individuals who are incarcerated at the location they're incarcerated. All right, so if they're as of April 1st, 2020, that's what they're gonna show in the federal counts. Now, for states who are willing to provide us with addresses of anyone who's incarcerated, where they live prior to incarceration, we'll create a file for them to use for state purposes. It doesn't change the federal count. So there is a group right now, they did, New York State did this in 2010. They provide us the addresses, so all the data that was used for state redistricting was based upon where they lived prior to incarceration. They're looking to do that again for 2020, but it is up to the state. 
Yes, sir. This is a question about the uh, importance of messaging. And I was wondering if you could share an example of how community organizations communicate with their constituents to say, for example, thanks to this, in this census, right, when this happened, we were able to do this or that so that people buy in to the yep. concept of participation. Yeah, I'll share some just examples that, of things that we're working with partners right now. So we're working with, um, you know, cities as complete count committees. So first we're identifying who are the trusted voices, who are going to be the ones who give the message to the community. And then we focus on what that message is. So do they have a large group of children under the age of five, let's say. We're going to focus on health related issues. We're going to focus on national school lunch program. Do people realize that from the time that child is five in 2020 till he turns 15 in 2030, everything that happens to that kid, all the health, school, the infrastructure, the buses, getting kids to and from school and things like that depend on census data, getting a complete and accurate count. So then we want to work with that particular community. Again, what's the best way to get that message out? Is it an in-language PSA, 15 second PSA on a local radio station? Is there a neighborhood newspaper we need to work with? Um, it, or is, who is that trusted voice and what type of event, when and where can, you know, can we talk about the census? Thank you, and we'd love to have you back for 2020. So the, the uh, congressional redistricting, again, is based on the population. So there are whole teams of states um, that are involved in that. The Census Bureau, we don't redraw the district lines. We just provide the data so that set groups can do that. How do you, what criteria do you use to examine the district? It's population. It's all based on population. Does it uh, include the race, religion, um, uh, immigration status? Yeah, so in, in the past, uh, or uh, let's look at 2020, the questions that were, the uh, information we're collecting. We're collecting name, age, and date of birth, your race and ethnicity, whether you own or rent your home, your gender, your relationship to the first person on, your, on, the, on the form, husband, wife, son, daughter, um, and then we'll see if the citizenship question is yeah, on it. That's I, all the data that's I, being collected. I'm giving you to set the boundary. Now, it's such a gerrymandering that you know, it's very difficult to determine how you determine what uh, group of people should be in, in each conversion. Yeah, so I know some of the data they use is race, and, and total population. But again, that's not something the Census Bureau, we do not, we're not in charge of uh, congressional redistricting. We just provide the data that states can use to determine. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome.